especially with um, on the transgender medical procedures with a lot of the testimony that we've heard and, and some of the things coming out is this does cause a lot of harm to kids if they go through some of these things and, and then have regret afterwards. So the thought is let's be cautious with that process and make, and, and make sure that um, the kids are being protected. But if they decide to go through that, it's been a deliberative process and, and what we've done on the medical procedures bill, or at least the bill that moved out of committee, is to say, you know, it's fine to, to do that, but you, you would need to be 18 to make that decision. We don't want minors um, kind of being pushed into that for whatever reason. So that's, that's the idea, is there's that limited government that's sort of the, the, the framework, but there are exceptions, and one of those would be if, if people feel that kids are being harmed because they don't have really the ability to protect themselves. Uh, you know, uh, we have a question from Maddie Coltrane about an issue that's a next door neighbor to that one. And uh, back in the summer, the Supreme Court overruled or went back on or whatever on Roe v. Wade. Um, as a result, states right now are getting to decide for themselves and grapple with this issue. And you yourself, as well as much of your party, is pro life. Right now, Missouri has a, a near total ban on abortions here in Missouri. How do you feel about where Missouri abortion law is right now, and how might you alter it? So I'm generally supportive of where the law is right now. Um, and I, I do think also, politically, that law is not going to be changed. Missouri has become a very pro-life state. Missouri has elected a lot of pro-life legislators. I, that's, to be honest, one of the reasons there is now a supermajority Republican legislature is in the early 2000s when Missouri started to shift from a Democrat state to a Republican state. That was one of the reasons that that shift occurred. So I think that law is, I, I don't see really a, a change in that law. I don't see an appetite to do that. But so my, with that being said, my focus then is what can we do as a state to better support moms, better support babies. And one of the things that we've been working on is to expand um, Medicaid coverage for moms and babies. So right now, they get I think they get 30 days of coverage, something like that, after a baby is born, and then they get kicked off. Well, that's not very fair. I know as a, as a dad of three that there's a lot of things that go wrong in the first few months after baby is born. So one of our big initiatives this year that is also a component of the bill I was telling you earlier um, is to expand Medicaid coverage for moms and babies for uh, an additional year after a baby is born. So trying to do more to support moms, support babies. We have a number of things that we're trying to do to make um, adoption easier, to make foster parenting easier. So that all goes to it as well. Let's keep talking about kids for a minute. Clay Skidmore asks, do you, did you see, he says, Republic and the Battlefield schools are possibly switching over to a four-day school week. Would you support a four-day week over a five-day school week? You know, I, I, my opinions on that are torn. I think it's, it's a good idea for the districts themselves to make that decision, whatever works best for their district. I know that there are a lot of districts that are looking at that now to incentivize teachers to come because, you know, a four-day can be more appealing than a five-day. So some schools are they're trying to balance all the competing interests there because you have a lot of teachers that like that approach. You have a lot of parents, especially working parents, obviously, who do not for obvious reasons. So I think that is something that is best left at a district by district level where in some parts of the state maybe it makes sense, in other parts it doesn't. I'm not super excited about the legislature weighing in on, on that. Uh, any, uh, we have a lot more to talk about so long as we have the time for it. And, uh, let me open it back up to the room. Any thoughts, questions, observations, agreements, or disagreements with our guest speaker? Yeah, um, I'm just wondering, you said that you were an attorney for a while before you got on the house. Are you still practicing? I, I do. Yeah, I, I sure do. So that's one of the kind of the interesting or, or sort of personal challenges that a lot of us who are, are younger in the legislature face is uh, we have to balance work obligations in addition to our legislator obligations. And that's probably one of the reasons you don't see 
very many people who are younger serving in the in the legislatures that there's really just a handful of us that are in our, our 20s and 30s most most legislators are are, reti are retired especially on on the Republican side you tend to have a, a large number of people who are who are retired and this is you know this is how they want to sort of spend their retirement years um, so it, it, it poses it poses a challenge in every person that is also trying to balance another job has to figure out a way to make it work and thankfully I've been able to but that that is tricky for a lot of folks I would like to keep the floor open yeah okay may I ask two questions okay. ask as many as you want I'm yeah. good with it yeah okay. go for it um, so in regards to combating gun violence in schools uh, would you be in support of like increasing funding for schools to have more police like armed police officers yes on grounds 100 percent and 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 we have been doing that over okay. the years and I, or you know since I've been in the house um, and I think that's going to continue to be a, a discussion because there's also the alternative option of like doing following what other states do where where certain classrooms the teachers are allowed to be armed but there are different safeguards and training opportunities that need to go in place before they can yeah that that's right and and I'm personally okay with that I don't think that that's that's really that's not a silver bullet type of solution, and you have to be careful about that. I, I don't think we want to have a situation where we're just as a state, you know, handing a gun to every single teacher and right. saying, you know, <laughs> good luck. Uh, I think that would be a pretty terrible idea. But if you have certain teachers who are trained and they want to do that, um, if, if we can figure out a way where that makes sense and you have safeguards in place, I think that's something to consider as well. And my second yeah. question. So a couple months ago, there was a discussion um, of limiting the county assessor's ability to continue increasing property tax. Yeah. Um, is there? Is that still moving forward? Yeah. So of one of the things, obviously, that we we've seen over the past couple years that's pretty weird is the increased value of used cars and how that is skyrocketing a lot of our personal property taxes that we all pay to the Green County Assessor or Christian County or whatever you live every year where you have this 20 year old car that you know you're paying you know whatever 15 bucks on it two years ago and now all of a sudden it's it, the value has gone up exponentially because of sort of supply chain issues and everything else we've been dealing with over the past few years and now you're paying $45 on it and that just that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense so we do have a, a number of bills going through the legislature to try and address that little quirk that we've seen over the past couple years and, and doing we, we've done it in a few different ways we'll see which ultimately if any makes it to the governor's desk but we have a few different approaches where we're trying to tackle that where the taxpayers aren't getting screwed but also in a way that it's not hitting the county's bottom line too much just yet because that would cause a pretty big shock to them so trying to figure out a way to stabilize that we've passed a couple of bills out of the house to do that i'm not sure where they're at in the senate um, but great, great question, and we are working on that because that's been a really weird, frustrating thing over the past couple of years. I know I've been, I don't drive new fancy cars. They're all kind of older and beat up, but it's been pretty annoying that I'm yeah. paying a lot more now than I did when they were newer and less clunky. Thank you. Yeah. We got time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, what is one bill that you wanted to pass, and then can you give me one reason why you think it didn't pass? And before we move into that, a uh, couple. I hate to cut you off. You give these great answers. Two minutes, please, as we're running the sure. time. Okay. So, are you talking? So you're talking one bill that I've tried to pass previously. Mm -hmm. um, so it's actually a bill that I think is has a really good shot of making it to the governor's desk this this year. And since I only have two minutes, I'll just broadly. It's a bill that I've worked on closely um, with a number of my friends across the aisle. I try and do things in a bipartisan way as much as I can um, for a number of reasons, which maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that in a second. But it's a bill that tries to help um, new innovators, entrepreneurs, people who are trying to bring brand new products or services to the market, a way to do it 
without having to jump through all the normal regulatory hurdles and government red tape that they put on that, that far too often crushes good ideas before they even get off the ground. So it's a way that tries to um, foster those types of things coming to market faster while also making sure there is some oversight in place where you're not just bringing like dangerous things that could hurt the public into the market. So it's an idea that's um, been passed in a few other states and they've had really good re results. So it's one additional toolbox that we can put in our Missouri toolbox to say, hey, Missouri's doing cool, innovative things. We want innovation. We want entrepreneurs to come here. And, and, and so that it, it, failed, it didn't make it all the way to the governor's desk last year. Um, I think it has a good chance this year. So that would be one bill that I'm super bummed didn't make it, but I think we have a good chance to get it done this year. Great question, thanks. I uh, uh, hate to cut you off, but uh, we've hit our time. A round of applause right. for Alex Riley. <laughs> Before we move on, if I am an interested citizen, how can I contact you? Best way to contact you. Yes, so I do this every year. And, uh, call me on my cell phone. I am giving you my cell phone number. No one ever takes advantage of this. I think I've had one person in all the years I've been coming to your class that's contacted me. It is 417-860-7555. That's my personal cell number. Don't hesitate to call. Don't hesitate to text. If you call or text and, you, and I don't respond right away, poke me again and I will. I'm not ignoring you, I promise. I've just got buried with something else. Um, don't hesitate to ever do that. I'm on all the social medias and all that. My email is is on the Missouri House website, but you have my cell number. Don't hesitate to use that. So that's 417-860-7555. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate Thank you. you. Appreciate it.